Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Innal hamdalillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udzu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina may yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa may yudlil fala hadiya lahu asyhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la syarika lahu wa asyhadu anna muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alamin innaka hamidum majid amma ba'd Ladies and gentlemen my brothers and my sisters we begin as per usual we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for each and every blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us and hopefully by being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase his favors upon us insha'Allah We also begin this gathering by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send prayers and blessings and salutations to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the family of the Prophet the companions of the Prophet, the Tabi'een, the Atba'i Tabi'een and to whomsoever that follows in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam till the end of time We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah bless this gathering We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He increases us in knowledge and hopefully with the increase in knowledge, the increase in humility and humbleness We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah provides strength and patience and victory for our brothers and sisters in Palestine We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah provides cure to those amongst us who are unwell and our family members We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us all insha'Allah our family members, especially our parents, our loved ones, and the rest of the Muslimin and Muslimat. Ameen, Rabbal Alameen. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And how is everybody doing? Sihat semua? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Welcome back, everybody. We... Oh, apa? Nanti kita address. Ada soalan buat awal-awal. But it's okay. Welcome, everybody, to CWG. This is actually our second uh, week. Uh, the first week, I believe it was at the very end of December. I would say uh, a lot of people were still busy. So this is technically kind of like the beginning of the year, the first class of the year. Uh, we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever that we learn for today, inshallah, in the following weeks will be of benefit. So alhamdulillah, <coughs> alhamdulillah, we are all here despite the rather beautiful and comforting rain. Uh, firstly, I, I would assume that this is not easy for all of us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the difficulty that we endure to pursue the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah accepts inshallah And well, while it is still raining, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah grants the du'as that we make inshallah Amin Rabbal Alameen Now, today inshallah we are going to continue with our study This time round we are learning the five prophets of strong determination The prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to as the Ulul Azmi uh, and, and for the first week, we started with a bit of an introduction pertaining to who the Ulul Azmi were and what makes them preferred over others and the reason by which we need to emulate these great men. So, first week was that. And we also began by looking at the story of Nabiullah Nuh alayhi salam. For today, inshallah, we are going to be focusing on the story of Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam. And in all honesty, I do not think that it is fair nor just to try and condense everything that we need to learn or can learn concerning Nabiullah Ibrahim in one session. That is impossible for a person to do. But because of the limitations of time that we have, we're going to look at maybe two sessions to discuss the important matters pertaining to Nabiullah Ibrahim. For today, inshallah, today's topic is titled Fixing the House and then Fixing the World. That is today's topic, inshallah. Before aspiring to figure out change in the world there is a need to begin change and reconciliation and refinement at home and this is what we gather i think in the life of nabila ibrahim alayhi salam let's begin here so this is in surah al-baqarah in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَنْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِيهَا نَفْسَهُ وَلَقَدْ إِسْطَفَيْنَاهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is Salam sejahtera, yes, to you as well. There's a question, hi, is it confirmed that Al-Qudu Academy is moving back to Arab Street? Eh, janganlah tanya soalan tu. <laughs> Sedih soalan tu. The answer is no. The answer is no. But make dua for us. Uh, okay. In Surah Al-Baqarah, 
There is a, a long set of verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the life of Nabi like Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then Allah concludes at the end of that particular story in which Allah describes Ibrahim by saying this. And who but a fool would be averse to the way of Ibrahim? For it is we who chose Ibrahim for a mission in this world. And surely in the world to come he shall be reckoned amongst the righteous. Now this is none other than a description of praise. Now there are many people who maybe are praiseworthy, but the praiseworthiness of people are of different levels. A person may have done a particular good and we say, well, this is good and praiseworthy and worthy of emulation. It might be the case. And certain people might have been much more successful in their lives and they say this is also worthy of praise. But one of the best ways to praise a person is to say that if you do not follow him, you're a fool. And this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says concerning Nabi like Ibrahim. Whatever that he has achieved, his values that he has imparted onto the people, his life story, if you turn away from that, from learning about the life story of Ibrahim, if you fail to follow in the footsteps of Nabi like Ibrahim, then there's one word to describe you. And that word is none other than a fool. And rarely does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use that kind of statement, but that's exactly what it is. So here we are trying to not be fools by learning the way of Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends that particular line of praise concerning Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam by saying, it is us, we, who chose Ibrahim for our mission on earth, and in the hereafter, we reckon him to be amongst the righteous. Now, this is also an important set of descriptions as well. Now, this is because there are people who we might know of their hereafter pursuits, but they may not necessarily be successful on earth. At least from the perspective of people, well, this is also an issue of like paradigm and understanding, right? So what do you deem to be the measures of success? For many people, there might be people who are successful on earth, but while Iyazu Billah, they may not necessarily be successful in the hereafter. And there might be people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would provide his rida in the hereafter. But on earth, we do not see much of his success. For Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam, what is impressive concerning him is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by his will and grace, Allah himself acknowledges, not by our measures, but by the measure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is what matters most, that he is a person who is successful in his work and successful in the hereafter. And that makes a person a fool to not follow in his footsteps. And this is how we need to kind of set the frame here. This is the man that we are going to be learning. Now, we look here now at a brief timeline of the life of Nabi like Ibrahim alayhi salam. Again, this is not a detailed timeline of the life of Nabi like Ibrahim alayhi salam, but at least a rough overview of what he went through. Now here we see in the beginning of his life, there's a story between him, his father, and his tribe. And then he's thrown into the fire, as we all know. And then he is saved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he meets Namrud. Now after that particular meeting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys Namrud. And, and we know of that particular story as well. Namrud, if we can dive a bit into it, when he hears the story that Ibrahim was a prophet of God, at least that is what he claims according to Namrud, and then the people were rather defiant towards Ibrahim, and at the height of their defiance, they chose to throw him into a fire. But miraculously, Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam was saved, unscathed, unhurt entirely. And for a person as evil as Namrud, a tyrant, Surely that makes him a bit afraid. So he calls Ibrahim alayhi salam and there was a conversation between Ibrahim and Namrud. He says that you know what, this may be just pure luck. There might be some form of magic maybe. He's giving assumptions of why Ibrahim was saved. And then he finally asked Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam, look at me and look at my army. And what army do you possess? At that question, at that remark, Nabi Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam then remarks by saying, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with me. And Allah subhanahu wa sends down, according to the narrations of the Mufassirun, an army of mosquitoes. 
And Namrud was ultimately killed because a mosquito basically went up his nostril and killed him from within. Right. So that's the story of Namrud. That Allah subhanahu can kill a tyrant, an evil person, by sending one of the smallest of the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this may not necessarily be the only instance. There are other instances in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would destroy an entire community by the most lightest and smallest of means. We know of Alam Tara Kaifa Fa'ala Rabbuka bi Ashabil Feel, exact same theme. Right? And this is not something that is rather rare to our human experience in history. Now, and then we know that Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam, throughout that particular journey, marries Sarah. And then there's also the story of Nabila Ibrahim in Egypt. Long story, and I think that we've discussed this particular issue before. I think once we discussed the controversial issue of the three lies of Ibrahim. Do you remember that story, the discussion? Right? Our scholars say that Ibrahim lied three times. But it's not supposed to be understood as a lie, lie, but rather a bluff in order to save his own self and to maintain the security of his family. Now at the end of it, they meet Hajar. Or Hajar was in fact presented as a gift from the king of Egypt. Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam by the suggestion of Sarah marries, by the suggestion of Sarah marries Hajar. And from that particular marriage we get Ismail. Now, and then there's a particular story in which Ibrahim, Hajar, and Ismail travels to Makkah. And then Nabila Ibrahim Alaihissalam leaves them there, goes back to Sarah, and was given the glad tidings of Ishaq. Returns to Makkah to raise the pillar of the Kaaba to establish Makkah as that blessed city we know. And lastly, there is the story of the sacrifice of Nabila Ibrahim and Ismail. That's generally the story of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now, we can look at a number of angles and a number of perspectives. Again, this is a discussion pertaining to ulul azmi, determination, will, discipline and work. Now, I was going to say one thing. If you look at the da'wah of Nabi Ibrahim, so we're looking at it from the perspective of da'wah specifically, right? Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam did a number of important da'wah work that Allah identifies in the Quran. Number one will be the da'wah that he gave to his father. That's the first one. Number two will be none other than to his people, his qawm. Number three will be to Namrud. And then there's also a mention of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam helping out or advising Nabila Lut. Nabi Lut was a contemporary of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then part of da'wah as well, Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam lays down the foundation of sharia by which we until today enjoy. Every time we do our prayer, when we give salutations to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, we do not do that except for we also mention the name of Nabila Ibrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alamina innaka hamidun majid. And the reason for so is this, that a lot of whatever that we enjoy today, whatever it is that we understand today, the values that we have, is directly connected to Nabila Ibrahim. He laid down the foundations oh, of the Sharia. Not only that, Nabila Ibrahim also established the city of Makkah. And lastly, he also begins a line of prophethood. Through him, we have Ismail and Ishaq. And to, through Ismail and Ishaq, we have a line of prophets. So there are many things to mention about Nabila Ibrahim. There are many contributions of Nabila Ibrahim. But I would want to focus on one thing. If you look at this particular timeline, what you can in fact identify is one thing. There is not one phase of the life of Nabila Ibrahim, there is no one project of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam that he underwent except for his family members were always involved. Always there. Allah will talk about this da'wah and that da'wah, this project and that project this value and that value but in each and every of these stories some family member will always be present and this is why i begin with the argument by saying ibrahim alayhi salam is as if telling us before you go out to change the world before you go out to fix the world fix your house first 
And this is also something that we find in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama. The achievements of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sallam is profound, unmatched. But there are many times in which the Prophet will remind us, Ibda binafsik wa min awlik. If you would want to initiate anything, begin with yourself, then others. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa did da'wah, we know that da'wah was done in a gradualness. It began with family members and then the public. We know that, for example, in Surah Tahrim, and I think that we've discussed this particular surah before. Surah Tahrim is literally a surah that talks about family, domestic affairs. Suddenly, at the end of Surah Tahrim, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Ya yuhan Nabi, jahid al kuffar wal munafiqin wa ghuluz alaihim wa ma'wahum jahannam wa bi sal masir." Allah talks about family members, family members, family members, family members, domestic issues. Suddenly, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "O oh, Prophet of God." Do not forget to pursue the word of Allah and struggle against the disbelievers and the hypocrites. And I was going to say, like, why is that verse mentioned there? What's the correlation between the domestic issues of the Prophet وسلم, and jihad? I was going to say, when you do jihad, when you do great work outside, you are unable to achieve it successfully until you fix your house. Same thing. And this is something that all of us need to contemplate. It's not an easy thing, in all honesty, right? It's a process. We try to do it slowly, inshallah. But that's the discipline that need, we need to work with. Now, I'm going to focus on three family members of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam for today. Next week, inshallah, we'll look at another angle of the life of Nabila Ibrahim that is worthy of study. Today, we'll look at three family members of Nabila Ibrahim and his interaction with them. And the first one will be none other than Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam and his father. If anybody would read the story of Nabila Ibrahim in the Quran, off the gate, the first thing that Allah talks to us about concerning Ibrahim is the relationship between Ibrahim and his father. That's it. It starts there. There's no mention of how he was raised. No. The first story was none other than how Nabila Ibrahim went to his father and did da'wah. Right? Now let's look at some verses here And this is in Surah Al-An'am Verses 74-75 Today inshallah I'm looking at short verses Very short verses So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says A'udhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajim Wa idh qala Ibrahimu li abih Azara a'attakhidh asnaman aliha Inni araka wa qawmaka fi dalalim mubin Wa kathalika nuri Ibrahima malakuta as-samawati wal-ard so Allah tells us, Lo Ibrahim said to his father, Azar. So for now at least, we take the name of Ibrahim's father to be Azar. Take you idols for gods, for I see you and your people in manifest error. So also did we show Ibrahim the power and the laws of the heavens and the earth, that he might with understanding have servitude. Now, when I was looking at this set of verses and doing my reading today, these two verses, for example, Al Imam Murazi Rahmatullah Ali, he did the tafsir of it in around six pages. And I'm like, how can two verses, in all honesty, you explain in six pages? And then you are reminded of many other verses in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa says, for example, in Surah Luqman, Allah says, if you would make pens, from all of the trees on earth and the seven bodies of water on earth would be ink by which you write that would not even then exhaust the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not even that and there are multiple verses like that and there's an interesting statement in the Quran also that I've been pondering upon which is a statement in the Quran Wama adra kama. and I think that this is a familiar verse right in my head, at least I can think of three verses that has Wama Adra Kama. Anybody remembers any? Wama Adra Kama. Al Qadr, good. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul Qadr, Wama Adra Kama, laylatul Qadr. In Surah Naba, if I remember correctly, Wama Adra Kama Yawmuddin. Thumma Ma Adra Kama Yawmuddin. Yawma la tamliku nafsul li nafsin shay'a, wal amru yawma idhin lillah. Surah Infitar, thank you. Correct. Barakallahu fiq. And there's also one more, Al-Qari'ah. Al-Qari'ah, Mal-Qari'ah, and then 
wama adra kamal qari'ah but there's a problem with the translation of that particular verse like how do you understand that so if allah says al qari'ah mal qari'ah wama adra kamal qari'ah how do you translate that the great calamity what is the great calamity and then some would say what do you know of the great calamity but it does not make quite sense it seems to be redundant it seems to be a repetition but our scholars say that the implication of that particular verse that particular structure wama adra kama is as if to tell us that well you have no clue about it which is quite ironic al qariya talks about the hereafter and in all honesty, we know many things pertaining to the hereafter. We know a lot of things concerning Mahshar. How Mahshar looks like is mentioned. The vastness of Mahshar, we know. The condition of people during Mahshar, we know. We know pertaining to heaven. We know concerning hellfire, concerning what you get in heaven, concerning the dress, concerning your age, concerning your condition, concerning your food, your enjoyment, everything. But there is also a hadith of the Prophet wasallam in which he says, Concerning heaven, ma la aynun ra'at, wa la udhunun sami'at, wa la khatara ala qalbi bashar. But in reality, heaven is something that the eyes have never seen before, and the ears have never heard of before, nor the mind, nor the heart could ever picture nor conceive. You have so much detail, but then the Prophet said, you actually don't know. This is to indicate what? That that's the extent of our understanding. Allah allows for us to have some form of relation of understanding. But in truth, the intensity of the rewards in heaven, can you ever understand it? No. So this is something that you find a lot in the Quran. When you look at Surah Al-Kahfi, for example, one of the stories of Surah Al-Kafi, one of the four stories of Surah Al-Kafi is none other than the story of Musa and Khadir. The beginning of that particular story is interesting, right? Somebody goes up to Nabi Musa Musa and asks him, O oh Musa, do you think that there is anybody who knows Allah better than you? And Musa replied by saying, no. And he was not boastful. That was the reality that he had in his head. Well, he is a prophet of God, a great prophet of God single-handedly saved an entire community, defeated the great tyrant Fir'aun, practiced a lot of miracles. Of course he knew Allah subhanahu the best. But Allah subhanahu ta'ala sent Nabi Musa alayhi salam on a journey, telling Musa that, you know what? There's somebody who knows better than you. And this is where we see Musa alayhi salam being a humble person. He went on that particular journey. If he was boastful or arrogant, he would say, why would I go on this particular journey? Who knows better than me? But he didn't. He went on that particular journey. And when he met Khidr or Nabiullah Khidr, there are three things that happened, right? Khidr damaged a boat, killed a young boy, and erected a, a, a wall. And Musa, at each and every instance, reacted. In which Khidr said, you shouldn't. And at the end of the story, Khidr says, you know what? There's actually something that you do not understand. There is more to them what meets the eye. So this is again a constant theme that you do find in the Quran, that there are layers and layers and layers of knowledge. So in this particular story as well, right, although it seems to be two verses that we are discussing, the layers of discussion that our scholars have brought forth is in fact enormous and lengthy. It is. And one should not ever judge a set of verses based on the length or its brevity. When I was in Egypt, I remember, I did a tafsir of surah Inna A'atayna Kal Kawthar. And Inna A'atayna Kal Kawthar is the shortest surah of the Quran by letter count. There are a number of surahs in the Quran that has three verses, right? So you have, Iza jaa nasrullahi wal fath, you have wal asr, and then you have uh, Inna A'atayna Kal Kawthar. But by letter count, Inna A'atayna Kal Kawthar is the shortest. I studied the surah of Inna A'atayna Kal Kawthar with a sheikh for six months. Here at the Kudu Academy, back in the days, right, I remember my brother teaching Surah Al-Fatiha for two years. It is not that we are deliberately extending or prolonging it, but being truthful to the discussion, that's how much you can learn. But in all honesty, you know, we don't have that much time, so we're going to discuss what matters, inshallah. Now, at the beginning of the story, Allah says, when Ibrahim went to his father and did da'wah to his father by saying a number of things. Now, as scholars mentioned, the first important thing is this. The most unnatural 
or if I could say uncomfortable da'wah or form of da'wah is it's not sorry is son to father typo the most unnatural or uncomfortable form of da'wah is son to father it is natural for a father to advise a son or a mother to advise the son or a sister to advise the little brother or a big brother to advise the little sister natural and it's supposed to be comfortable but for a son to preach to the father is the most unnatural thing for for nabila ibrahim alayhi salam that was what he had to go through from the very beginning to show the strength of nabila ibrahim alayhi salam and how urgent this particular matter was now the second issue that our scholars also mention here is pertaining to the figure of azar now let me mention that number one the majority of scholars say that azar was the father of ibrahim that's the majority opinion now a minority of scholars however they say that azar is not the father of ibrahim but rather the uncle of ibrahim now if a person suggests an alternative opinion then we need to ask why because the quran clearly mentions is qala ibrahim li abi abun in the arabic language is what father so if you change it to a different meaning that is not apparent nor literal you need to provide explanation now there are two explanations the first one is a cultural linguistic explanation they say that at times in the arabic culture if you have a person of seniority and one who you respect at times you would also call him father right and this is quite common in our culture in the malay culture also in the indian culture as well very quite common you call a person ibu the person is not your mother but because you respect that particular lady you still call her ibu a person is not your father but because you respect him as well you call him ayah very common so they say that's one reason now the only counter argument to that or the counter argument to that would be why do you have to resort to that when allah clearly says father you say that it is not father but rather uncle what presses you to take that particular alternative opinion so this is where we uncover that the reason that they say so is simply because of a sense of respect towards prophets what i mean by that would be they cannot accept the reality that a great prophet of allah has a father who is an idol worshiper now that is a very sensitive discussion as well as an extension to this particular discussion and the question is the parents of our prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam were they muslims or not are they in heaven or are they in hellfire now if you stick through to the sound ahadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam it's quite clear and even the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam himself mentioned so there's a hadith that is sahih that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam himself said i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permission that i seek forgiveness for my mother the prophet said but allah did not allow for me I ask Allah permission to visit her grave and Allah allowed. So what does that mean? There is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam also sound that a companion goes up to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam and asks the Prophet ya Rasulullah where is my father? And the Prophet replied by saying hellfire. And the Prophet is not being offensive. He's just speaking the truth. And then he turned around to that particular person again and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi said and by the way your father and my father is in heaven now these narrations right are clear but there are people who give other interpretations with good intention they want to honor the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam as much we say that one thing is clear pertaining to iman pertaining to guidance it is not dependent upon the other just because a person is greatly believing in allah a great saleh that does not automatically translate to other people around you becoming believers and this is something very constant in the quran when allah talks about for example the wives of nabiullah nuh and nabiullah lut right kanata tahta abdaini min ibadina salihain and the great example that we provide to you concerning this belief will be none other than the wives of Nuh and Lut. 
They were both spouses to great men of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they betrayed them and they betrayed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just because you are a great person, that does not automatically translate to other people around you becoming great people. However, let me just add, and this is very, very important. The question, however, is sensitive. Because it deals with the feelings of the Prophet ﷺ. If you are to discuss it from an academic perspective, you can. But to ask this particular question unnecessarily, to invoke certain emotions here and there, it is unfit and uncalled for. Right? Now, at the end of it, we resort to, in my estimation, the stronger opinion of the two, that Azar was in fact the father of Nabila Ibrahim salam and not the uncle. Because there are no other supporting evidences from the Quran nor the Hadith of the Prophet to suggest that Azar was the uncle. And there's no reason for you to, to resort to an alternative opinion. And because of that particular methodology, we resort to its default by saying that Azar was in fact the, the father. Right? Now, here it says, أَتَتَّخِذُ أَصْنَامًا آلِهَا Now, I was going to say, the other issue would then be this. Was Ibrahim impolite towards his father? Because he goes to his father and says, oh, Father, do you and your people take stone, take idols as gods by which you worship? Our scholars ask, and Ar-Razi Ali presents this particular argument as a matter of thinking. He says, was Ibrahim impolite? by saying that as a son to his father. Right. And I think particularly right, in our part of the world, in which I think that we try to be as polite as possible, politeness seems to be a hallmark of our part of the world. When you go to other parts of the world, people are a bit more blunt, people are a bit more frank, but here we truly, truly at times view politeness to be an important virtue to the extent that at times we exploit the notion of politeness. We exploit the notion of adab. At times that happens as well. So Alimamu Razi Rahmatullah he says, when you talk about the notion of politeness in regards to the way that you advise a person, it is not necessarily going to be dependent upon the words that you use, but rather words are proportionate to the situation. If you have a particular issue, for example, right, that you need to advise, but the problem is not severe, it's a slight issue, then maybe the way that you advise that particular person, you can use a bit of gradualness, you can be softer, you can allow for time, not an issue. Why? It's proportionate to the problem. If an issue becomes big, then maybe you add a bit more firmness and strictness in your address. But if a particular situation is out of hand, at the point of breaking, at the point of no return, it has gone far away from the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At this point, you cannot afford to be polite anymore. You cannot afford to be discreet anymore, but rather you need to call a spade a spade. So Nabila Ibrahim alayhi when he asked his father in that particular manner, he was not being impolite but rather he was being accurate and he's proportionately carrying himself the way that he, he should be. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah Ali, when he talks about the issue of advice and when he talks about the issue of da'wah, he says doing da'wah to people or advising people is like washing your hand. He says that you wash your hand the way that you wash your hand proportionate to amount of dirt that is on your hand. If there is slight impurity or dirt on your hand, filth, you rub it lightly and that will suffice. But if there's a lot of impurity, a lot of stain, a lot of dirt, it would not suffice that you rub lightly, but rather you need to put in a lot of work in. So that's da'wah. It's about understanding the terrain, understanding the severity of the situation, and then putting in work proportionate to the problem and the situation at hand. This is in fact called wisdom. So whatever that Ibrahim salam was doing was not an issue at all according to the standards of, of the Quran. Now the fourth issue in this particular story would be idol worship. That's the main issue. Now scholars mention a number of things pertaining to idol worship. Idol worship is the first non-Islamic religion that existed. Now, if you talk about like old religions, there are many different types of religions and different objects of worship. Even during time of Nabila Ibrahim, beside idol worship, you have people worshipping stars. 
different other objects, different world views, and so on and so forth. But our scholars say that the oldest alternative to Islam is none other than idol worship. And then they ask the question, when did idol worship start? Anybody remembers? When did idol worship start to become a thing? We hear an answer, Nabiullah Saleh. Any other answers? According to Imam Al-Qurtubi, it started after the time of Nabiullah Adam. So it started very early. And the first five idols are actually mentioned in the Quran during the time of Nabiullah Nuh. It became a thing during the time of Nabiullah Nuh salam, at full force. And there were five idols that were worshipped. And they were what Dan, Waswa'an, Wayagutha, Waya'uqa, wa Nasra. And Allah talks about these men, these idols who were originally men in the Quran in Surah Nuh. Now, here is a narration, and this is in Al Imam Al Tabari's collection, talking about the beginning of idol worship, why it happened, what led to it. So he says, وَقَالَ بُنُ جَرِيرِ حَدَّثَنَا بُنُ حُمَيْءٍ And then he says, كَانُوا قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ بَيْنَ آدَمَ وَنُوحِ They were righteous people between Adam and Nuh. And they had followers who imitated them or followed them. When they died, their companions who were imitating them said. So you're talking about these men. So according to Imam Al-Tabari, rahmatullah Ali, وَدَّنْ سُوَا أَنْ يَغُثَ وَيَعُنْ قَوَا نَسْرَ Were in fact children of Nabiullah Adam. Besides Habil and Qabil. This is, a, this is an opinion. So they continued the work of Nabiullah Adam alayhi salam. They were revered and respected in the community. But it all changed after their death. So here we see, they said, the next generation, if we had made pictures of them, we would have been more eager to worship them if we had mentioned them. So they made pictures of them. So the reason or the beginning of the story would be that when these men died, the people started to say, you know what, we should commemorate them. We should draw pictures of them, images of them, so that when we worship Allah, we look at these pictures, we would be so much more eager to worship. There are multiple narrations. But the intention of creating images in the first place is so that when we look at these images, we remember Allah. When we look at these images, you know what? Ibadah becomes better. When you look at the Arabic language, right? It's an interesting word. لَوْ صَوَّرْنَاهُمْ كَانَ أَشْوَقُ لَنَا إِلَى الْعِبَادَةِ If we would have made images of them, it would have been more ashwak. In my weird way of thinking, this is where you get the word shuk. If you pray to Allah directly, tak shuk. But if you have images of great men to look at, then ibadah will become so much more shuk. And in all honesty, there are people who do this until today. Right? At times we go against this particular practice, right? And we always say, at the end of the story, right? Idol worship did not just appear. Similar to all other vices on earth, they do not just appear and become normal in society. Vices, evil, maksiyah always begin small. And then it is normalized and becomes widespread in society to the extent that people think, well, this is in fact the truth. So you always have to say, be careful of the slightest of wrongs because they would in the end lead to bigger wrongs in society. So idol worship began with good intention. The intention was to reveal great men. And then see what happened. Now, then they died and others came. Shaitan came to them and said, well, you know what? They actually worship these men. Back then, people didn't just look at them so that ibadah is more shook. No, these pictures, these images, they actually worshipped. And through them, they obtained rain. So worship them. So from reverence, from the remembrance of Allah through these great men, it became worship. And those images became idols by which it remains until the end of time. So it's a big issue. Right? In our society, at times, we find these particular type of practices as well. If you want to be really strict with this particular issue, if you study history, this is not something that we should, we should accept. 
So Allah Ta'ala A'la wa alam. Now the story of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam in the end, right? If you kind of look at the entire thing, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam begins with his father. And some scholars also argue that one of the reasons why Allah sends Nabi Ibrahim to his father is simply because in order for change to happen in a particular community, at times it is smart to actually go straight up the rank. At times it is so. You can do da'wah in different ways. Certain people da do da'wah to peers. Certain people do da'wah to those beneath them, and so on and so forth. But at times it's also a brilliant strategy to do da'wah high up. When you look at the time of the Prophet wasallam, one of the things that the Prophet also did was to do da'wah to the leaders of tribes. Whenever that he saw leaders of tribes in Arabia, he would approach them. Why? Hopefully when the leaders of tribes will become Muslim, the followers would also follow suit. So when you look at this first story, this is how Nabila Ibrahim Alisan went to his father to speak to him. So this is the first story. Now let's move on to the next story. At any point of time, anybody would like to ask anything, please do. Now the second story is a story between Nabila Ibrahim and Sarah. Now I'm not going to focus too much on Hajar. I would want to only focus on Sarah at least for now. Now this is in Surah Hud. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qalu ata'ajabina min amrillah, rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu alaykum ahlal bayt, innahu hamidun majid. Falamma zahaba an Ibrahim al-raw, wajadhu al-bushra yujadiluna fi qawmi lut, inna Ibrahim la halimun awahun munib. Now this is a story pertaining to Nabiullah Ibrahim and also Sarah. And Allah says, and they said, do you wonder at Allah's bidding? The mercy of Allah and His blessings are on you, O people of the house. Surely He is praised glorious. Now, what's the context of this particular verse? Now, the context of this particular verse would be when Nabila Ibrahim salam was in Makkah, left Hajar and Ismail in Makkah, and then returned to Sarah. Returned to Sarah, and then there was a group of people or angels that came to them. Remember that story? Now, in the beginning, Ibrahim and Sarah did not suspect anything. The culture of the Arabs, as we all know, would be they are famous for hospitality. Very well known for hospitality. In, later on in Islam, we have this thing of diyafatu was sidana tu was siqaya. It is of great honor to be a provider of food to people, to give people drink, to provide people protection, to provide people shelter. This is something that Islam prides itself doing. And it's taken from Arab culture. Even during the time of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam. So that is why when we go back to the story of Nabila, uh, Musa and Khidr, the second story, it's only the last story pertaining to the wall. Allah begins telling us a story by saying that, if, that Musa and Khidr went into that village and nobody cared for them, correct? They went in and nobody gave them food. Nobody gave them drink, nobody gave them water. Allah is only telling us that particular piece of information because it is descriptive of the type of people they were. If in a society, nobody cares to do anything good, it's an indication of a huge problem in that particular society. Right? And the reason that he erected a wall is to protect the wealth of those people from, from them. Now here, the two men came to Ibrahim and Sarah. And Ibrahim and Sarah immediately provide some food. And there was a grilled sheep or lamb. And I'm not sure about you guys, if you see grilled lamb, an entire grilled lamb, or you smell it from afar, the mula drool Right. My very first time seeing an entire lamb being roasted in front of me was in Egypt. Very first time. Presented to me. And it was not only presented to me, it was presented entirely to me. I've never had that particular experience before. I was in Egypt, I shared this particular story, I think, before. I met a friend, Egyptian, and they are overly friendly, Egyptians, I think. I'm not sure whether that is a, a form of praise or not praise, but they are overly friendly. The second night, they says, my parents ask you over. I'm like, ni macam matai, matai pula. My parents ask you over. They want to blanja you makan. I went there, and there was this huge feast, and in the middle of it, a whole lamb. And I asked him, like, and, and how many people are you expecting? They said, no, just you. I'm like, ni capacity kecil. <laughs> First time. But still, it was very appetizing. 
But these men, when they were presented to them an entire roasted lamb, they did not extend their hand over it, which made Ibrahim and Sarah suspicious. Like, what's up? What's the deal with these people? And then they introduced themselves. We're actually not men, but rather angels of Allah. We come to you to give you the glad tidings that your wife Sarah is in fact pregnant. And there Sarah stood laughing of amazement. Like, how can I be pregnant when I'm such an old lady? And here, Ba'ali, and she says, my husband, my spouse, also an old person as well. And here they say, do you wonder at Allah's bidding? I remember a teacher of mine once said that this is a particular word that a person should etch in their hearts. Ata'jabi namin amrillah. Why are you so surprised by the will of God? Right? And it hits you really hard, I think, when you go through certain problems in your life. And then at times you think about when the solution would come. When will this pass? Is there even a way out? And then we look at this particular verse and the angels tell Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam, but why are you so worried? Why are you so surprised that Allah subhanahu is so powerful? Right? This is a story. Now in any sense, the mercy of Allah and his blessings are on you, O people of the house. Surely he is praised glorious. So when worry had gone away from Ibrahim and good news came to him, he began to play with us for Lut's people. Now we'll talk about this particular issue later on. Now a number of important things that our scholars discuss. Number one, the characteristics of a good husband. Now what makes a good husband? That's the first question. Right? And I've asked this particular question to my own self many, many times before. And my answer to what defines a good husband or the characteristics of a good husband would be that he is a person who is connected to God first and foremost. One. Number two would be that he is compassionate and loving towards his family members. And number three, he's a person of patience. That's it. If there is a person who is a husband, and number one would be that he's always thinking about the reward of Allah. Whatever that we do in the family, the reward of Allah first. As a collective, as a unit, the reward of God. Number two would be, he has this sense of lovingness, compassion towards family. He tries his very best to provide. He tries his very best to guard and to honor the family, at whatever cost. Patut tu jadi suami tu kena kerja keras. And this is me reminding my own self, at whatever cost, provide for the family, at whatever cost. Right? Number three would then be, he has patience. Because trying to bring the family together to Allah and trying to provide in all honesty is not an easy task. So he must be a patient person at the same time. So this is number one. However, in certain situations, a husband can try their very best, but things can still get out of hand. And in many situations, you try your very best, you simply just can't win. That's the situation that a lot of husbands go through in their lives. Especially when it concerns to pleasing the heart of the person, of the other person, maybe the spouse, maybe the children and so on and so forth. There are situations where you do all you can, but you can never please the hearts of people. Now you're going back to the story of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam and the marriage of Ibrahim to Hajar. Not Sarah, Hajar. Now who suggested that Ibrahim alayhi salam married Hajar? Sarah. And the suggestion from Sarah was, in fact, a noble suggestion. Sarah felt that she was sad not being able to provide Ibrahim a son. My husband, a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, cannot leave behind a legacy of children, of offspring. I'm sad. And now there is this good woman, Hajar, or Ibrahim, marry her. I hope that you know what, through her, Allah subhanahu would offer you offspring and progeny. So whose suggestion? Sarah. But as soon as Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam got Nabila Ismail as her son, as his son, sorry, what happened to the heart of Sarah? She changed. It was not that she was jealous. She was just displeased with her own self that I cannot provide happiness to my husband. What does she say? You know what? I urge of you to leave. Go somewhere. 
And Allah Subhanahu wa guides Nabi Allah Ibrahim AS, Ismail dan Hajar to Makkah. That's the story. But imagine that as a husband, your wife who told you to marry another. Oh, ini dah cerita lain lagi. Eh? I need to thread lightly and carefully. <laughs> but that's what it is, right? Your wife, your first wife tells you to marry another. And now she tells me to leave. What do you do? If I stay, she's going to be offended. If I leave, am I going to be seen as a good husband? So this is again the story of you can't win. As a husband at times, you see it as if you can't win. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has better plans, right? Nabi Allah Ibrahim AS goes on that particular journey that he in all on he does not know where he is going to arrive. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them. A long period of time. At the end of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Nabi Allah Ibrahim AS, then leave them in that barren land and return to your first wife. Now Sarah in that particular narration waits faithfully. So at the end of it, the entire story of the angels coming happened. Our scholars say one important thing, right? In a relationship, if you trust each other, and one good things for each other, miraculous things happen. But again, the work needs to be put. The emotional struggle has to be gone through. And this is the bulk of the burden of Nabila Ibrahim alayhi salam that he goes through. Right. And these are things that maybe you know people don't see husbands go through. Kita selalu in our classes kita puji orang perempuan dan sekali sekali kita kena puji orang lelaki juga. Jadi adil. Right. At times in all honesty and I've received a lot of like queries and discussions pertaining to this issue of husbands stating that they feel unappreciated a lot of times. Right. At times people don't know what husbands go through. Right. They fall at times and they lose a lot of things, they are hurt, but they never show a bit to their wives. And at home, they put on a particular mask as if everything is fine, but in their hearts, they are broken to pieces. But because they would want to be a good husband that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to be, they continue putting in the work. There are people who are like that. Our parents were like that. When you ask them, are you okay, ayah? Okay. When have you ever asked a parent, Ayah, are you okay? Father, are you okay? And they say, I'm not okay. When was the last time that you heard that? You will never hear that. They will say, I'm okay, inshallah, make dua for me. Right? So this is something that goes through in his heart. But he goes through it. He trusts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anybody amongst you who are going through difficulties that nobody knows, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you in your heart. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replace your sadness with happiness, inshallah. Right. And for spouses, children as well, to once in a while ask, really, right, are you doing okay? Is there anything I can help with? Right? It helps a lot in a particular relationship. So again, if in a particular relationship between spouses there's trust and love, and as a like-minded plan to achieve the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together, miraculous things happen. For Nabila Ibrahim, at the end of that particular journey, Sarah, an old lady, becomes pregnant. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted them, their sacrifices, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides for them. So this is one. Number two, husbands and emotional stability. Part of what we discuss, because why? Look at this. Now after Allah tells us pertaining to the angel saying, Ata'ajabun, ata'ajabina min amrillah, O Sarah, are you surprised at the bidding of God? Why are you surprised by the miraculous things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do, right? Immediately after that, Allah says, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبَ عَنْ إِبْرَهِيمَ الرَّوْءُ وَجَاءَتْهُ الْبُشْرَى يُجَادِلُنَا فِي قَوْمِ لُونَ So when worry had gone away from Ibrahim and good news came to him, he, begged, he began to plead with us for Lut's people. To mean what? What happens after that? Ibrahim goes on a journey now to meet Nabi Allah Lut alayhi salam, to advise him on how he needs to carry himself with the people. And we know that the story of Lut was a horrible story. One of the worst things ever done by communities on earth in history is the people of Lut, right? Ibrahim came to advise. So this is the new project. Go to Lut, tell him what to do. Strategize maybe, and so on and so forth. But before he continued with that work, what did Allah say? 
Allah says, when worry had gone away from him and good news came to him. So what does that mean? It means that you're not going to be able to achieve great things in your life until you have emotional stability. All this while, it is as if Allah is saying, you don't see this, but in the heart of Nabila Ibrahim Alaihissam, he was worried. Now imagine again, now he is with Sarah. Now who is not there? Hajar. He's worrying about Hajar, worrying about Ismail. And before that, he was worried about Sarah. Is Sarah angry at me? Well, she told me to leave, so I left. But is she actually, and this is something that happens a lot, right? You go from the house, for example, you, you would go to your wife and say, B, I want to go futsal today. Can I go futsal with friends? And she stares at you. And then she gives you a sharp, precise answer, which is, okay. And you think to yourself, okay ke tak okay ni? It's worry. Allah says, when we remove worry from the heart of Ibrahim and remove worry with good news of the glad tidings of his heart, then he was emotionally stable and now he goes on to do da'wah. And this is the emotional stability that we are talking about. Now, a lot of times, and we have covered this particular topic before, right? Emotional stability, emotional soundness from the perspective of Quran and the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are talking about Nabila Ibrahim. Now, what did Allah say in the first place? Whoever that turns away from Nabila Ibrahim is in yet a fool, correct? Even for somebody as great as Nabila Ibrahim he was still burdened emotionally. So whenever that you feel burdened, you feel anxious, you feel worry, you feel grief, know that it's a common human experience. But you know what? As Ibrahim did, he seeked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trusted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so should we. Now lastly, here it says, forbearance, tender-heartedness, and connection to God. I asked early on, what makes a good husband? I said most probably, a person who is connected to Allah, a person who has love and compassion, and a person who is forbearing. Where did I get this from? Well, the Quran. Allah says at the end of it, Inna Ibrahim ala halimun awahun munib. Most surely Ibrahim was forbearing, tender-hearted, and of returning to Allah. So by the Quran's standard, this is as a husband, as a father, who Ibrahim was, a person who was forbearing. Forbearing simply means a person when even somebody wronged, they have strength in their hearts to forgive or to look away. Forbearance. And it takes a lot. It's easy for you to punish. It's easy for you to be spiteful. But it's so difficult for you to turn away and say, well, it's okay. Number two, tender-heartedness. Lembut hati dia. Right? And dikeranakan kelembutan hati. And because of the tender-heartedness of Nabi Ibrahim and the deep love that he had for his family, he was able to go to the lengths. And lastly, it is none other than his off returning to Allah. Why, why, do we, why does Allah use the word muni? Off returning. Because in life, there are situations in which you are going through this particular journey and you sway. At times in life, the difficulties that you do face in life causes you to deviate. At every point of deviation, you return. That is what makes Nabi Allah Ibrahim salam great. He felt down, he returned to Allah. He felt worried, he returned to Allah. Any form of deviation in your path, you return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the word munib. Now, the last person that we are going to be talking about, or the last family member that we are going to be talking about with none other than the children of Nabila Ibrahim, generally. Now, for this, we look at this set of verses. And this is a long dua of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the context of this particular dua is none other than when he left Makkah. Some scholars say later on when he meets Sarah. But Wallahu ta'ala a'ala wa'alam, the idea would be that he's thinking about his, his children. He makes this dua. Wa iz qala Ibrahimu, Rabbij al haza al balada amina. وَجْنُبْنِي وَبَنِيَ أَنْ نَعْبُدَ الْأَصْنَامِ رَبِّ إِنَّهُنَّ أَضْلَلْنَ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ النَّاسِ فَمَنْ تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي وَمَنْ عَصَانِي فَإِنَّكَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ The du'af Nabi Allah Ibrahim is this. Remember when Ibrahim said, Ya Allah, make this city one of peace and security and preserve me and my sons from worshipping idols. 
And that's the first issue that he faced, right? People worshipping idols. We don't want that. Ya Allah, they have indeed led astray many among mankind. He then who follows my ways is of me. And he that disobeys me, thou art indeed of forgiving, most merciful. Ya Allah, surely I've settled a part of my offspring in a valley unproductive of fruit near your house. Ya Allah, that they may keep up prayer. Therefore, make the hearts of some people yearn towards them and provide them with fruits. Happily, they may be grateful. Ya Allah, surely you know what we hide and what we make public. And nothing in the earth nor anything in heaven is hidden from Allah. Praise be to Allah, who has given me an old age, Ismail and Ishaq. So that is why we say that the better context is after he meets Sarah. Because there's a mention of Ishaq. Most surely, my Lord is the hearer of prayers. Ya Allah, make me keep up prayer, and from my offspring too. Ya Allah, accept my supplication. Our scholars say, Ibrahim asked for seven things. So as a leader of the household, as a parent, either a father or a mother, some scholars say, this might be the thing that should constantly be asked by a parent. And the seven things are none other than these seven things. Number one will be none other than security. Number two will be none other than guidance. Number three, prosperity of Makkah. So in our instance, the prosperity of our house or our community. Ask for the ability to continuously do salat. Ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us people that others receive as well. Again, as a mention of salat, and lastly, that whatever that we do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts. Now, we can continue and discuss all of this, but I actually want to only focus on one thing and one thing, which is none other than the item, the only item that was repeated twice. And the only item that was repeated twice here is none other than salat. It is as if to say, that as a parent, that should be your primary concern towards your child. And this is not something that is only mentioned here, but rather mentioned many different times in the Quran and also in many ahadiths of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam. Now, a good example is in Surah Luqman. Surah Luqman is a very brief surah and a very concise, straightforward surah. It begins by talking about knowledge is from Allah. The end of Surah Luqman is also, knowledge is from Allah. The middle of Surah Luqman would be none other than the advice of Luqman to his son. What makes the story of Luqman unique is that he is not a prophet. But Allah dedicates an entire surah to him. There are other prophets who have children and may have advised their children. But Allah dedicates an entire surah of a non-prophet, a person that we barely know anything about him, in fact, dedicates to him. Some scholars ask, why does Luqman get a surah for his own self? You don't have the surah of Zulkifli. You don't have the surah of Idris. You don't have the surah of Isa. You don't even have the surah called Musa. Why well, you have a surah called Surah Luqman? Why is it important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dedicates an entire surah to a particular person who is virtually unknown? Right? And the reason would be that so that he might become a person that everybody can relate to. Because for prophets, although they are standards of emulation and following, at times it's quite difficult because the standard is high. This is me being really honest. The standards of prophets, although we are supposed to follow them, there are certain challenges here ever. But for Luqman, who was a normal human being, you can relate to him entirely. There are two sets of advice of Luqman. Number one pertains to becoming a person who has a good relationship with Allah. And the second advice of Luqman was becoming a good person on earth. And it begins with none other than, Ya Bunayya, Aqimis Salah. Wa'mur bil ma'arufi wa anil munkari. وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَكْ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ وَلَا تُسَعِرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ فَخُورٍ right? وَاقْسِدْ فِي مَشِّكَ وَغْدُدْ مِنْ صَوْتِكْ إِنَّ أَنْكَرَ الْأَصْوَاتِ لَصَوْتُ الْحَمِيرِ Luqman mentions three things. He's number one, oh my child, establish prayer. And then be active in social work. Enjoin good, forbid wrong and have patience. 
And then he says, and be a humble person and do not be like a donkey. That's that particular parable. The words of voices will be none other than the voices of donkey. When I was in Egypt, I remember in our flats, right? And today at times, whenever that you hear that a person keeps a dog in their house and is barking a bit loudly, people complain, right? I have that type of a neighbor currently. Tiba tiba, there's a big dog in one of the houses. We're not sure which one yet, but it's always noisy and people complain. In Egypt, you would live in a particular apartment and somebody at the lower floor would keep a donkey in their house. It's actually quite common. Right? You would have people keeping sheep or cows in their houses. I'm like, okay. You keep cats, they keep cows. And at times I ask, like, why? And some of them would simply give an answer of quick access to milk. I'm like, what? <laughs> Supermarket, lah. Right, and then I remember, what's, what's Peel Fresh slogan? Any fresher, you have to peel it yourself, squeeze it yourself. So for them, we have milk. Squeeze it our own self. Right? And for donkeys, it is most irritating. Because the nature of the donkey, the demeanor of the donkey would be that whatever happens, they will make noise. If they are hungry, they will make noise. If they are full, they make noise. If they are afraid, they make noise. If they are happy, they make noise. At everything, they make noise. So Lukman tells his son, concerning the way that you carry yourself, be humble. And if you do not need to raise your voice, do not raise your voice. The default in Islam is silence. You speak when you need to. And that is why the Prophet said, Man salmata naja, who retains silence, he is usually saved from wrong and calamities. So the default should be silence. But today we don't have that, right? People always want to say something. You go online, my opinion is fool. I think, uh, always like that. At times I think to myself, well, your opinion does not matter really. <laughs> but at times, especially if you're not qualified in all honesty. But this is the situation. But again, when Lukman told his son, become a humble person, have patience, be actively doing social work, he begins the set of advice by saying what? Pray. So prayer is the key of everything. Our scholars, whenever that they are asked concerning raising a child, and the litmus test or the indication of success in upbringing a child, scholars will always say what? It is not of academic excellence, it is not this, it is not that. They will always say, if you are a parent and you have a child, that knows to pray when they need to pray and they need not to be shouted at. They go outside and they go hang out with their friends. They lay part, whatever it is. Timing of prayer comes, they know to go to the mosque and pray. If you have that type of child, as a parent, you have succeeded. That's it. Because even according to the Prophet ﷺ, if a person can master his prayer well, usually everything else in life follows suit. But if prayer is not attended to well, usually other things in life would also be problematic. And here, Nabila Ibrahim alayhi when he makes his lengthy dua, the only one item that he repeated twice is none other than what? Salat. But again, we can say about this particular issue, prepare about salat and so on and so forth. But one thing that I think we need to identify and understand is that at times, and I'm, sure, I'm not sure about this, but it's odd for an ustad to say, at times, solid is difficult. Please don't judge me. <laughs> it is difficult. To do something five times a day over and over again, with whatever that is going through in your life, at times it is difficult. Right? There needs a, an amount of work they need to put in, in all honesty. And that is why, in the story of Nabila Ibrahim, when Ibrahim made this dua, the children were either young or an early stage in their life. It needs to start early. During the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa he talks about the education of prayer to children, the Prophet says, begin to teach your children prayer at the age of what? Seven. And begin to discipline them concerning prayer at the age of ten. It needs to start early. So another important thing would always be, I would say, motivating your children by creating an environment that makes prayer easy. And at the top of that particular list would be, have your children see you pray, always. Now, I want to shift to something else, and this is more of current news. 
right? It started in Malaysia, a form of motivating people to pray. And there's a movement currently going, it is called hashtag Geng Solat Subuh Macam Jumaat. Are you aware of this? It started a couple of months ago, right? So there is a celebrity, uh, a media celebrity, Alif Sata, right? Who, now in all honesty, for him, I've, I've been impressed with him for a bit of time. I'm not sure exactly what art form he actually does. I think he's a singer first. He's a singer and then a host. He acts a bit, but he seems to be moving away a bit and doing other things like business and so on and so forth. But he's a good example of a person who has a huge amount of influence and using that influence positively. He started this particular campaign of inviting people and motivating people to do Salat Subuh congregation at the mosque and hope that the turnout will be like Salat Jumat. He's been doing this for a couple of months, by the way. I think it's entering two months. And the mosque in KL where he lives, full of Salat Subuh. Full. That particular movement spread to other countries. It spread to Brunei, it spread to Indonesia. And yesterday morning, there was the first event in Singapore. Masjid Yusuf Isa yesterday. And the turnout was full. Alhamdulillah. Right. Now, these things happen and, and people ask the question, so what do you think about it? I, I have nothing against it. Well, I applaud it. And there are now efforts to expand that particular movement to the other parts of Singapore. Right? And hopefully people do it. But with whatever that people do today, there will always be naysayers, right? And you see this also online. A number of things that people mention. Number one, certain people say for Alif Sata, he's doing this for publicity. There are people who say that. Oh, you know what? He's a famous person. He just wants to add his influence. That's it. And then these people also come in by saying, you know what, these people who follow, they don't want to go to Salat Subo, they just want to meet a celebrity. And then other people come in by saying, oh, you know what, they just go there for a bit of time. Nanti dah penat, tidur malas, so tak pergi lagi. And these are one of the things that you, in all honesty, the word is toxic. Eh? Number one, and in all honesty, right, based on the information that I gathered, Alif Sata's movement that has garnered a lot of people, and now, I'm not sure whether this is sensitive to even say, even government bodies and organizations have went up to him and said, can you make this particular movement into like our government project? Political parties now go up to him and say, let's do this as you know, our project, a collaboration between our party and you. And Ali Sata's teachers, and one of his teachers is in Malaysia, by the way, Dr. Maza, suggested to him to say, no. That would interfere with many, many things. So let it be something that you do from the people for the people. Now, in regards to how we judge people, because people are saying that, you know, this, he's doing it for publicity, he's doing it for fame and so on and so forth. What's our principle in judging things like this? Our principle is simple. This is established in our religion. Nahkumu bil zawahiri, wallahu yatawalla bil sarair. We judge by whatever that is apparent, whatever that is in the heart of people, it is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever that we see apparently is that he's doing good. Done. Full stop. And even in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu A person who motivates others or shows others to good, they would get the bulk of the reward of others doing it. So based on the hadith of the Prophet, and based on the theory of apparentness, inshallah, this is a good thing. Then, but you know what, there are always people like this. They have too much time, I think. And there are certain people who have certain illnesses and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all inshallah in which they are jealous of people doing good. Just because you can't do good, do not prevent other people from doing good. And from the perspective of people who go, right, people who join this particular movement of going to subuh and so on and so forth, right, they say, no, oh, this is something that they're doing to meet the celebrities. Now, just to be fair, right, if you are going there because you are motivated, and what did we say early on? We said early on that solid is an easy thing or a difficult thing. If you ask me, it's at times difficult. Especially for going to the mosque for subuh. And some scholars would even say that the differentiation between a true believer and a hypocrite is praying subuh jamaah in the mosque. I'm like, whoa. If you're a true believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the proof would be none other than you can commit to congregation pray in subuh. That's what they say. 
And you think about it, right? When you go to Salat Subuh in the mosque, you get multiple blessings at the same time. So this is the idealistic structure. You wake up a bit before Subuh. And then you pray a couple of rakats of Tahajjud, the night prayer. When you're done, you take wudu, or if you're already in the state of wudu, you don't need to take wudu again. You wait for, for the Azan, you pray two rakat Qabliya. You go to the mosque, and you pray Subuh in congregation. After that, you begin the work that you need to attend to. There are three types of blessings here. The first blessing would be to do ibadah at the timing of istijabah. According to the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, Dua and ibadah is most heard during what timing? The end of the night. Or at least the last third of the night. Number two, we said just now, Salat Jemaah in congregation. We don't need to even talk about going to the mosque, praying together. On top of that, there's already blessing in that as well. It's a sign of faith. Number three, then the Prophet wasallam said that blessing shall be for those who begin their matters beginning of the day. Back then, right, we used to hear this from our nini, nini, and machi, machi. They would say, if you wake up for subuh, after that, don't sleep. Right? You're closing the doors of barakah. These are not empty words. This is, in fact, a promise from the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet, in fact, made a dua. Allahumma barik li ummati fi bukuriha. Ya Allah, please bless my community when they begin their affairs early. When the Prophet wasallam would send an army, when he would send people for trade, when he would do da'wah, he would always begin the early part of the morning. Why? Because there is blessing in it. The only problem with that particular timing would be there is also a great amount of pleasure in going back to sleep. At times you understand this, right? Seronoknya tidur waktu tujuh pagi itu. Uish. Before going to work, right? The amount of pleasure that you get from sleep. So you ask yourself, what pleasure that you want? Do you want the pleasure of that which is described as the brother of death? Or do you want the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this particular movement, I do not see anything in it except for good. In all honesty, right? As long as you keep your knee straight, right? You are motivated by these people, fine. In regards to guidance, Allah says that there are two types of guidance. One guidance is called Hidayah to Tawfiq. Oh, I didn't eh? Hidayah to Tawfiq means divine guidance. Allah can guide a person to good directly without any form of intervention. And then there's something else called Hidayah to Irishad. Hidayah to Irishad simply means Hidayah of Allah through different means. There are people who become better people because of a friend. The friend tells him, Jumah, kita pergi class, let's go to class. He gets guidance through what? A friend. He reads a book. He watches a video. He listens to something. This is called what? Hidayatul Irshad. So part of this that we are talking about is this. So if you say, Ustaz, this is a form of motivation. I seek the pleasure of Allah, but the motivation is helpful. Fine. So long as you do not say, I go because of the celebrity, it's fine. Number two, pertaining to saying, oh, these guys are not going to last. Well, who are you supposed to judge? A believer towards the other believer should only ask for one thing, good things for others. Right? Love for yourself what you would love for others. And this is the golden principle of ethics in Islam. To want for people what you would want for yourself and to be pleased with what people have, similar to what you would be pleased with your own self. Right? So the point again would be that Nabila Ibrahim salam understands that in order for me to change the world, I need to change my family. Allah begins his story by talking about him directly going to his father. And because of the severity of the situation, he goes head on. Allah then tells Nabila Ibrahim salam, you have now wives and family, attend to them. Because if you are unable to resolve things at home, your emotional instability will not allow for you to do good work. At the end of it, Allah subhanahu wa also tells Nabila Ibrahim salam, as you do work, what is also important would be to leave behind an important good legacy. Children, make dua. And the most important thing that you need to ask for your children is none other than they become people of prayer. So this is, ladies and gentlemen, the ulul azmi that Allah mentions in the Quran, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is how we are able to lead our lives as well. We don't want to be fools, as Allah subhanahu says in the Quran. So heed the advice of Allah in the Quran pertaining to Nabi Allah, Ibrahim alayhi salam. 
Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa alam we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever that we learn is of benefit insha'Allah and with that I end and I open to questions if there's any I'm looking at certain things online here on the live stream Salam Ustaz Afwan I didn't attend today Walaumah apology ya online it's my, it's my coach by the way it's okay coach you guys are just too nice. Huh? Tak payah lah. If you don't come, you don't need to apologize. I have, I have students here. Don't come and then apologize. So, so sorry, so I can't come to class. It's fine. It's fine. Allah is your matters, inshallah. Never miss. I would think Mansa Mata Naja wouldn't apply so much or always in social relations, especially spousal relations. There's needs to clear communication. Yes, okay, good. So there is a question by uh, a lady pertaining to the balance between sound communication and silence right so the suggestion here would be start especially within spousal relationships if you maintain silence things are not going to go well things are actually going to go very bad bergaduh the husband gini je duduk <laughs> are you okay not uh. <laughs> and the wife similarly right now again that wasn't what i said the principle is the default should be silence. If there is a need to say, to speak, to communicate, speak and communicate. Right? Even in the hadith of the Prophet, there are many hadiths in which the Prophet calls to silence, and there are also hadiths of the Prophet that he calls to speak up. What did the Prophet say? Qulil haqqa walau kana murra. Speak the truth even if it's bitter. That's what he said. So he's commanding people to speak when there's a necessity. The companions of the Prophet, when they met the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa did they meet and then sit in silence? No. The Prophet would ask their conditions. How was your day? How is your iman? How has yesterday been? Did the Prophet ask them? Yes, because there is a necessity. So I'm not calling to full silence. I'm just saying, be mindful about your words. And the famous hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa as a good guideline would be, man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhiri, falyakul khayran. Those who truly believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let them say things which are good or beneficial, and if not, remain silent. So what's the criteria of speech? That your words are beneficial. If it's not beneficial, you resort to silence. Yes, he actually motivated me to pray subuh again in mosque too. May Allah bless him. May Allah bless him, inshallah. Fuh, ada orang geng ni ya. Geng solat subuh macam Jumaat. I saw a new hashtag for Singapore which is Geng Solat Subuh Macam Hari Raya But Hari Raya have to wear something kan? Their intention for going to Solat Subuh at the mosque is between them and Allah Correct, I agree right? Nobody has we, Even when, when you look at the seerah of the Prophet right? There were a number of instances in which certain companions did wrong in battle There was a companion who when he was dueling with an enemy The enemy suddenly said Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammad rasulullah when a person says the shahada, his blood is sacred, you can't kill him anymore, correct? But this companion, he thought this is a ruse. This is just him trying to escape, so he slayed him anyways. That particular issue was reported to the Prophet and the Prophet went to that particular person, why did you kill him? Didn't he say, Ashadu Allah, ilaha illah, Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah? And the companion of the Prophet said, but he's lying here, Rasulullah. Clearly he's losing, he's about to be killed. He only said Ashadu Allah Allah to get away from me killing him. The Prophet said, Did you cut his chest open to see what was in his heart? And you don't know. Right? I've had this particular question before. A person said, Ustad, I, I know of this particular couple and, and they're getting married. And the guy is not a Muslim. But the guy now gets, becomes Muslim converts and then gets married. I think it's a bit problematic. I said, Why? Because I think that he's only becoming Muslim to get married. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, did you cut his chest open? There are many situations in which a person does become Muslim to get married, and then later on they develop well, they learn Islam, and they become better Muslim than other people that I know. Is that not a possibility? Yeah, so who are we to close the doors of the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. Right. Uh, there's an interesting story as well, but it's a bit off. There are people, however, who use Ashadu Allah ilaha Allah wa Ashadu Nahman Salat as an escape tactic. During the time of Umar, <coughs> one of the things that happened during the time of Umar that was considered to be big, I'm saying that it's big simply because it had multiple ramifications. 
was that they conquered Persia. And the reason that Omar decided to conquer Persia is simply because the Persian Empire, who signed a peace treaty between them and Islam, violated that peace treaty. So Omar attacked Persia and eventually conquered Persia. One of the emperors of Persia were caught, and his name was Hormuzan. Brought back to Medina, which is interesting, right? And then they, they brought him to Omar when Omar was asleep in the mosque. And the guy is like, where's your king? Where's your emperor? Hurmuzan, the Persian guy, right? And Omar was asleep. Said that. And he was like so surprised that a leader of the strongest civilization at that point of time was sleeping in the mosque and wearing the exact same clothing everybody else was wearing. And that was this. Omar woke up. And Omar said, okay, he's here. Bring him to my house. And we're going to interrogate him. Like, why did he do what he do? Right? And, and the guy was surprised, like, your house, what about like a palace? They didn't have palaces. Abu Bakr, Umar, Usman, Ali, all stayed in their houses, even if they were Khalifas. Palaces of Khalifas only exist in the time of the Umayyads, Abbasids, and later on. And then Umar said one thing, but remove from him his silk, his gold, and his precious stones. So he was a person, he was an emperor, right? And that was how he dressed. Umar said what? Remove from him his silk his gold and his precious stones. And it's an interesting discussion pertaining to that. Our scholars say that the way that you dress will affect you in regards to your humility or your arrogance. Things are not value neutral. No. What you possess, who you befriend, what you have, what you dress will affect you in your demeanor. It will. Right? Again, I'm not here saying to people that you should not buy nice things. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, be careful. If you're buying things for your own self, to reward yourself, to remind yourself of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you, fine. A lady buys a lady dulu. Eh? Lady dulu basu gai lah, kena adil. A lady buys a Dior bag, for example. Right? Not to look down on people, but rather to reward your own self. Although I would argue lah, that you can actually buy another bag at the same price, you know, at half that price, with better workmanship, we can argue for that. But katalah, dia memang nak Dior sangat, tak apalah. Uh, suka hati Dior lah. <laughs> I'm quite proud of that Dior, I don't know. Kadang-kadang <laughs> kena puji dia sendiri. Fine, as long as they're not looking down on people. Done. And they know that these things can affect them. There are people who are like that, right? They, they get a huge amount of money, they buy a new watch, let's say they buy a Rolex. Sikit-sikit gini. Macam, ish, bayarlah. Same thing for guys. Same thing. So, certain things that you wear can affect you. Now, they bring Hurmuzan to the house of Omar, and Omar begins to interrogate, like, why did you violate the peace treaties? I thought we had it, fine. He said, I want to drink of water. They got him a drink of water. Before he drank from that particular cup of water, he threw it to the ground and broke it. And he said, like, why? He said, I'm afraid that this drink of water had poison in it. And Omar said, if you wanted to kill, you would have killed you just now. No, we didn't. Gave him another glass of water. He drank. He started to interrogate. Like, why, 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 why? Out of nowhere, Hurmuzan said, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And people got quiet. And Omar understood very well. He knew that he's now alone caught and people knew they knew that they did wrong the only way to not be punished or killed is by saying what but again you still can judge a person's intention right you can't be killed but you could be punished otherwise so Hurmuzan was imprisoned at the outskirts of medina throughout his stay in that particular prison at the outskirts of medina he had a relationship with a slave a persian slave by the name of abu luqlu'ul majusi and their communication over the years, they plotted the assassination of Omar. That's the story. Right? They knew for a fact that there's no way that we can ever defeat Islam today. And there's no way that you can defeat Omar in a wrestling match or a fighting match. The only way that you can kill Omar is when? In his prayer. Oh, so that's the story. Right? There are other interesting things as well. I remember yesterday there was a person who showed me a particular video Rarely do I get, I get like a video set. Can you comment on this particular video? It was a video of a person who was praying, and then a huge monkey. When I say a huge monkey, it's like huge, half the size of that particular person, goes in front of that particular pachi. And the pachi was praying in Malaysia. The pachi was praying throughout the entire prayer with his eyes closed. 
He opened, and to his surprise, there was a huge monkey. But he continued with the prayer until the very end. He kind of fidgets a bit and moves a bit, but he continues with prayer. So somebody asked me the question, Ustaz, can a person not invalidate his prayer in that particular situation? Oh, ini perbincangan panjang. I don't think I want to discuss this. Tak apalah, itu teaser je. <laughs> Wallahu a'lam. Now, the, the thing is, to the story of Omar, when Omar was stabbed, did solat end? Yeah. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, a companion of the Prophet, went forward and replaced Omar to become the Imam of prayer. And they continued praying. Uh, so, the ruling here would be that solat cannot be deliberately invalidated. Except for a situation that harms you personally, and you cannot avoid it at all. Then you can invalid your prayer. And if not, whatever it is, you continue with prayer. There's a hadith of the Prophet in which he says, when you pray and a black snake or a scorpion emerges, I'm not sure under what circumstance you're going to actually experience that. Salat Ustaz, betul-betul keluar ula, Ustaz. Ula hub. What, if, what do you do? Right? In the hadith of the Prophet, you kill the black snake or the scorpion and return to prayer. You continue with prayer. Nah, tak apalah, ini perbincangan lain. Panjang cerita dia. Wallah alam. Uh, did Nabi Ibrahim make dua for Bani Israel? Generally, yes. Generally, yes. He made dua that they are guided. We says, if we avoid irsyad guidance, will that nullify us from getting hidayat taufiq? Now, so we are talking about two types of hidayah, right? The hidayah of means and the hidayah of divine uh, providence, directly from Allah. The natural process or the normal process is you're supposed to go by or use means first in order to reach the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's usually the natural process. In order for you to get guidance, you study. In order for you to get guidance, you befriend good people. In order for you to become a better person, you put in the work. You're supposed to take means that are necessary. But the reality of Hidayah to Taufiq is to state that there are certain people in their lives in which even without means, Allah could suddenly switch on a particular light. Can it happen? Can. But that's not something that you should hope for. You should put in the work and hopefully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you. I myself, I have certain uh, people around me that have actually experienced this before. There was a particular, in, in the old office, in the Arab Street office, ah, sedih, cikak Arab Street. There was this particular gentleman, right? He, and he was always hanging out. What was the restaurant beside us? Eh? Not on the right or on the left. Anybody remembers? Yang ada nasi lemak Australia dulu. If any remembers that, that part, right? They were hanging out at that store. After work, a group of bikers. If anybody has ever noticed that, between six to eight, they would always leap out there. Right? So this guy said, I'm always there, sir. I don't pray, I don't know much about religion. He says, but I'm always there and I see people coming in. One day I woke up and suddenly I felt in my mind, I want to go to that particular class and I want to learn religion. Until today he learns religion. <laughs> what, what turned on that switch? Don't know. You can say, oh, maybe he saw people entering into al Qudwa Okay, maybe. But ultimately, Wallahu a'lam. Are there any questions here, ladies? Yes. Uh, how do you approach the like, difficulty in being disciplined? Our brother asks, how do we cope with the difficulties of being disciplined? Istiqama. There's an interesting statement that Imam Ibn Qayyim says that the greatest miracle is the attainment of istiqama. No miracle is greater than the miracle of istiqama. A person is able to dedicate their life to doing something repeatedly. Does not compromise anything. Now, the only way, I was called to say, for you to continue to have istiqamah is to always remind yourself of what you were intending to begin with. If you had strong will and intention at the beginning of the journey, even if you deviate in the middle and you remind yourself of why you set out to do this in the first place, you are able to realign. That's one. Right? So that's why niat is greatly important. And Nawawi Rahmatullah Ali even recommends that Niyah is supposed to be checked in the beginning, in the middle, and the end, right? We've talked about this before. Number two is what we're talking here. Having motivations around us. Having like-minded people, right? Some people require external motivation, certain people don't. 
right? Uh, if you go to the gym, for example, right? There will always be one or two people that they are just different. They are cut from a different cloth. A lot of people who go to the gym, they will come with friends. Datang bising-bising. They work out a bit, they take selfies, right? Start to flex. You think really that you can grow muscle in like one, two set of exercises? Are you, are, you, are you real, right? And then there's a type of person that he comes day in, day out with nobody but themselves. Whatever happens, you know what? They're there. And I've spoken to these people before, like, why are you so dedicated? And they always tell you of something that happened in their life. Right? They say, bro, I once almost died. I, I heard this answer once. I had a particular illness, low immunity. The doctor said, you know what? I need to work hard. I need to exercise. And that's why I'm here. I'm not here for show. I'm not here for anything else. I'm here for survival. And whatever it is, I'm going to go into doing this. Right? So I think niat is important. And then having motivation would also help. Allah Last, I think, with regards to congregational prayers at the mosque of Fajr prayers, would that be encouraged for women as well? Would there be any preconditions bearing in my responsibilities? Well, that's the, that's the, the thing. So I would say that going to the mosque for congregational prayer, my position would be it is equally encouraged for men and women. That's my position. But in the situation that women are not able to do so because of responsibilities at home, know that their intention and willingness to go, even if they don't, they don't get to, they will be rewarded even in the intention. So the default would be men, women equally want to go to the mosque for prayer. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa understands the responsibilities on the shoulders of women. So this becomes an ease that Allah has provided for them. And even if they don't get to go, they will be rewarded for it. And that's why there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in which once the Prophet said, right, that the best prayer for women is at home. And that hadith is in context of a person who asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi ya Rasulullah, I want to go to subuh for prayers, but I can't do so because of responsibilities. To her, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi replied, the best prayer for women is none other than at home. Allah ha'ala. Eh, banyak ni. Let me see if the, the, the question fits. Jauh sikit lah. Ustaz, how does one know if he has fully forgiven someone? Ah, nanti kita discuss. What's that question, sir? Yes. Hello. Last one. During prayer, if your mother calls you, hmm. are you supposed to break the prayer? What's the ruling of that? No. If your mother calls you in prayer, what's the ruling of it? The ruling of it would be that there is no obligation for you to reply. Right? We were talking about this idea of in prayer, right? And, uh, and, and whatever it is, you cannot invalidate your prayer. And the, and the reason for so is that invalidating your prayer deliberately is a form of disrespect to Allah. Of course, whenever that we are thinking about these kind of things, right? We are thinking about respecting people. But you're already in prayer. The one that we should respect foremost in that particular situation is Allah. And that is why there are a lot of discussions, right? What if a person gives you salam? Because salam is also, to give salam is sunnah, to reply salam is wajib. So in prayer, what do you do? It's wajib, right? So as scholars say two things. Either you can wait until the end of prayer and then try to look for a person and say, wa alaikum salam, if you can find that particular person. And if not, there are scholars who suggest that you sign. Allahu Akbar, right? Somebody say, Assalamualaikum. I'm not sure whether he's joking or he's trying to play a fool. The clear, clear nampak orang salat. Dia salam kenapa? Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Salam tak jawab dosa. Kan salat. So, some scholars suggest you raise your hand, sign. And you continue prayer. Right? And communication with people in prayer invalidates prayer as well. Right? Communication with Allah is fine. That is why there's a narration of the hadith in which when a person sneezes in prayer. Can you say Alhamdulillah? Yeah. Allahu Akbar, you're, you're reading your, your, your surah, Hachim. Itulah bunyi, bunyi, bunyi bersih dengan dia kan? Hachim. Alhamdulillah. Is it okay? Okay. But what about saying, Ya Rahmukallah? Why? Because Alhamdulillah, you're communicating with Allah. Ya Rahmukallah, you're communicating with these people. Right? There's also one thing that I see in our society in regards to prayer. This idea of inventing or not inventing prayer, right? Certain people, they want to, they want to enter into prayer and they take multiple efforts. Have you seen that before? Allah, macam 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 lah bunyi dia kan. Allah, Akbar, tak boleh, tak boleh. Allah, Akbar, tak boleh. They are trying to look for, for I'm not sure what, maybe vibe, maybe feeling. 
But there's a legal problem to this. If you have done your itaqib to ihram, prayer has started. And to invalidate after beginning your prayer is prohibited. So before prayer, at the beginning of prayer, compose yourself. Kalau nak cari feeling ke apa ke, sebelum prayer, when you're standing. And that is why the Prophet says, when you walk to prayer, you're already in prayer. And carry yourself with humility. That's what the Prophet said, right? So you need to be careful early on. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa'ala. I think we've gone way past time. Let's end, insyaAllah. Makin banyak soalan, kenapa ni? Soul food, nasi lemak. Yes, correct, Rishad. Betul, nama dia soul food. Tapi dah tak ada dah. Kemarin saya cek. Lepas saya jenguk office sebelah tu. <laughs> tak ada, tak ada. Alright guys, we'll end insyaAllah. Next week, we'll continue the story of Nabila Ibrahim AS. But we're looking at the notion of sacrifice. <coughs> Next week. Sacrifice for family, sacrifice for Allah, and sacrifice for self. These are the things that we're going to be looking at for next week, inshallah. Uh, before I end, sorry? Oh, yeah, next, next week. Next week, we have our conference, inshallah. For those who are not aware, we're organizing our Sira conference. Uh, it's a four hour program, five, five, four hour program, inshallah. For those who are interested, please do join, inshallah. So, next, next week, we'll continue the story of Nabila Ibrahim, alayhi salam, right? Uh, for now, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever that we learn is of benefit, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow for us to follow in the footsteps of Prophet alayhi wa salatu wa salam, especially Nabila Ibrahim, especially Nabila Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah allows for us purification of our hearts, refinement of our character, beautification of our words. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah forgives us for the things that we are aware of and the things that we are not aware of. May Allah subhanahu wa provide us strength to be able to continue to fulfill our responsibilities. Rabbana zalamna anfusana. وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وبارك والحمد لله رب العالمين Thank you so so much everybody have a good day السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. and those attempt to answer them soon inshallah. thank you. ليس الغريب هو الذي فارق الديار وودع الأهل، ولكن الغريب هو الذي يجد والناس من حوله يلعبون. ويصحو والناس من حوله ينامون ويسلك درب الخير والناس في ضلالهم يتخبطون وصدق الشاعر